Wonderful. So, hi everyone. That was the best fun fact I've heard in a long time. Thank you, Diana. Um, my name is Linda Leugas. I'm a children's book author and I'm an illustrator. Uh, I'm a programming educator, a fairly mediocre programmer, I'll bet being doing this for the past nine years. Uh, but I imagine possible futures for a living. And my work started with this idea. If code truly is the universal language, the first foreign language in addition to English or Chinese that our children are going to be learning in primary school, instead of grammar classes, we ought to be having more poetry lessons. And what I mean with that is the same way we don't learn a natural language only by conjugating irregular verbs or practicing the grammar rules. We learn a language by using it, by singing it, by flirting in it, by dancing with it. Even though programming is not a natural language, I do think that the ways in which we teach ought to have more diversity in them. So my day job is to write stories about the world of software. Because so often we forget that stories are the original way we humans have learned. We have learned about ourselves, about each other, and about the world around us. And I get to write these stories for children all around the world because the Hello Ruby book series has been published in 28 languages right now. Which means that I get to travel and meet children from very different cultures and see how they interact with technology on a daily basis. And instead of only one book, actually it's a book series around computer science. So not only coding, but also the hardware of computers. How computers talk to each other, so what are networks and the internet about. And the latest book that just actually came out in German also is about machine learning and AI and how the world and society is changing because of these things. So if you want to check it out, you can go to helloruby.com slash de. But the thing I wanted to talk to you today about has to do with a love letter to the computer. Because I think we all have this almost passionate, almost human-like relationship with the machine that so many people see as cold, as foreign, as somehow only logic-driven. And I at least remember very well the first time I got a computer, and I suspect many of you have these strong, strong emotional stories. Um, about your first experiences with computers. And I wanted to do something for primary school teachers around the world to showcase them this passion that programmers and developers have for their machines. And I wanted to do it imagining if Wes Anderson or Sofia Coppola fell in love with the computer. And when I started this project series, like a YouTube video series, I knew nothing about writing, screenwriting, I knew nothing about directing or show running. But I do think that programming and learning computer science has taught me a lot of applicable skills across different domains. So even though I don't have an MFA from film studies, I could look at a big problem and try to figure out how to decompose it into smaller pieces. And instead of being afraid of a blank page, I figured that, okay, I'm just going to start to fiddle around and try out different things and see what happens. So next I'm going to show you a really quick video trailer of the series to give you kind of a feel and taste of what it felt and looked like. Hi, my name is Linda Leogas. I'm a children's book author, illustrator and programmer. This series is a love letter to the computer and it's intended for you, the creative and curious teacher. In this series, we'll go inside a computer, become routers, learn about electronic circuits and collect training data for machine learning systems. We'll ask questions like, what actually is a computer? How quickly can computers solve problems and how computing education can be delivered equitably and inclusively to everyone? We'll cover code, algorithms, hardware, problems and people. We'll explore what computer science is, what it looks like in the real world and how it can be shown in your classroom across different disciplines. After this series, I want you to be able to look at a piece of technology with confidence and see the possibility of something different, new and exciting. So the series is out there, recommended to any of your primary school teacher friends or so forth, but it kind of sparked this bigger conversation for me around what are the actual stories we tell around computer science.
And often when a non-computer science person hears about computer science, this is what they think about. Whereas in reality, oftentimes the biggest ideas of computer science, they actually go far beyond the machine. Uh, things like the binary system, uh, the algorithms that are starting to govern our world, uh, the way computer architecture has stayed pretty much the same in the past 70 years, even though computers used to be bigger than this room, and now they fit into our pockets. And the whole craze around learning to code is almost becoming counterproductive right now. I do feel like we have this big, big focus on learning a new fancy programming language, but we're forgetting uh, the big principles and also the people behind these ideas. And they are the things that really matter. And this is a quote often attributed to Edgar Dijkstra uh, that says that computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. So I think we who have the longest experience with this industry, we should really start thinking about what are these big ideas that we want to be teaching for the next generation that won't be using the fancy new React framework or, or working with the same tools uh, we do nowadays. But we're not here alone. And when I think about the people who helped me in my work, they actually come from the, 19, the early 19th century, people like Maria Montessori or the 1960s, Loris Malaguzzi, Tuve Janson, Jean Piaget and Seymour Puppert. And it's interesting that for our industry, which tends to look forward into the future and also very much focused on the everyday, I feel like the biggest inspirations are actually in people who uh, were doing their most prolific work maybe 40 or 50 years ago. And it's not in, only in the realm of pedagogy. Obviously, the grand big names of computer science that we saw in the video before, they keep inspiring us every single day. And I don't know if there's many fields like ours where inventions done in the 1970s or 80s, like the neural networks, are becoming applicable 40 years later. Or the idea of mainframe computing, which is kind of finding uh, its angle again in the stuff that, um, that, that people are doing now with VR and AR. So it's somehow important for our industry to also know how to look backwards and to draw inspiration from the history of our discipline. And somehow we need to start making this more applicable for everyone. We can't only focus on people who learn through reading and writing. Jean Piaget, who's a really famous children's pedagogist, uh, pedagogist from the 50, uh, 1950s, he said that you can't offer an entirely organized intellectual discipline for people only by giving them pre-organized vocabularies and concepts. That true learning is grounded in action. And with that in mind, what are then the things that we should be teaching our children if it's not the new JavaScript thing or, or the new Rails framework? Well, I think one of them is obviously curiosity. Well, another one is the fearlessness um, that often people, or fearfulness that people face when they, they see the computer, so not that. And then finally, wonder. Because I do think we all start our careers in technology with a huge sense of wonder, and somehow we lose that as we grow older. And in a sense, what I think I'm doing today is preparing kids for a world where more and more of the problems around us are actually computer problems. There's other ways of saying this, like software is eating the world or so forth. But I think a gentle way of saying this is that more and more of the problems around us are computer problems. Problems like energy, education, healthcare. But they're not going to be solved with the brains of the current engineers alone. We need a radically more diverse group of people to get excited about computers as a problem-solving to tool, as a tool of self-expression. And here's the thing. I think we, as an industry, we need to change quite radically. We still have this very strong narrative around tech industry as being the underdog or the counterculture story, because that used to be the case. But it's not the case anymore. We won. Technology won over, and we need to start to think like the empire and take responsibility. We are not the rebel alliance anymore. And one of the saddest things I see out there right now is that most of the stories we tell around technology come from a place of fear. They are dystopias about the future. And it makes me think a lot 
about the next generation of people and how are we going to offer them a more pragmatic and optimistic idea about the technology industry. So with that in mind, I figured that I would give you kind of three basic building blocks of the big computer science ideas that I'm working on a daily basis with, trying to convey an optimistic, pragmatic, and applicable sense of wonder for the next generation. And because I'm a children's book author, they come in the form of an A, B, and C. And A, obviously, is for the word algorithm, something that is very, very familiar for most of you. But if I ask you to explain what actually is an algorithm, some of you would have trouble doing it. But the kids, they actually know really well. They say, oh, Linda, of course, algorithm is a step-by-step -step solution to solving a problem. So if I'm the programmer, and this person here is the computer, and I'm trying to brush, uh, teach the computer to brush its teeth, I need to break down the problem of brushing your teeth into pieces. And the kids actually play at this, and it's a lot of fun, because we learn something very profound about how computer scientists and programmers get really frustrated. Do we know what a toothbrush is? Do we need to first define the toothbrush? And then when we get the toothbrush to your mouse, uh, mouth and say that stop moving the toothbrush, uh, we remember that, oh, the toothpaste. And then we remember that, oh, the toothpaste has a cork and now we're holding toothbrush um, in one hand and so forth and so forth. But through an activity like this, giving step-by-step -step instructions, the kids also learn that programming is not lonely. The myth of the lone cowboy programmer still holds strong. But what I want to show to the children is that the professional programmers of today, they work in teams where there's different kind of talent. There's pair programming. There's a lot of debugging going on in programming. No one writes perfect code at the first go. There's often the annoying process of going through your mistakes and, and being able to sustain that um, frustration of not getting the perfect code uh, uh, to work uh, from the get-go. And then finally, that there's a lot of creativity involved in programming. So armed with this knowledge, the kids try out another activity around algorithms. I give them five numbers, and I tell them that your task is to put these numbers in order of magnitude, so that the smallest is on the left-hand side and the biggest is on the right-hand side. And it takes the kids roughly maybe three to six minutes, depending on the age, to do this task. And then I ask them to do the same with these numbers, and the same with these numbers. And the kids get really frustrated, and they say, Linda, this takes forever. And I tell them that this was the first lesson of today. Never compete with a computer on a task like this. The computer will always be far faster, far more precise, make fewer mistakes than you, but it still needs instructions. And one way a computer would approach a task like this is this. It would start from the beginning, it would compare 1 and 56, and say 56 is bigger than 1. Let's keep it like this. It would move on to 56 and 4, say 4 is smaller than 56, let's swap them around. It would compare 56 and 70, looks okay. Look at 70 and 20, let's swap these around. And then it would move all the way to the beginning. And keep repeating this over and over and over until the numbers are in order. And this, like all of you in the room know, is the bubble sort algorithm. The working horse algorithm of computer science born sometime in the 1960s. We don't know exactly who invented it, but we do know it was a human, not a machine. So now the children know that an algorithm is a step-by-step -step solution to solving a problem, that humans write algorithms. And then I show them real code, and we discuss how syntax is built uh, for programs. But still, this is not enough. We need to go deeper, and we need to show the context of where in the world might you see an algorithm. So we look at a search engine, and we try to figure out where is a search engine algorithm hiding, in the order in which you see the updates, uh, or the search results, or the ads you see online. And we look at Facebook, and we think about where in Facebook are algorithms hiding. For example, in the ads, but also in the order in which you see your friends' updates. That's an algorithm that uh, optimizes for retention and time spent on the site. And then finally, we look at YouTube, and we figure out that the autofill, that's an algorithm. We look at the next up queue of uh, videos. But more and more, we also talk about the kinds of content we create online. 
because most of the children, they've seen something weird on YouTube, like surprise Play-Doh, ex Peppa Big, Stamper Cars, Pocoyo Minecraft video, or a video where uh, Peppa Big goes to a dentist and horrible things start to happen. And I try to explain them that the reason why this keeps happening is because this content is not intended for you. It's intended for the algorithm. Every one minute, there's over 400 hours of new content uploaded on YouTube. So there's no way a human can go through all of that. And there's algorithms that take care of all of this, and they get gamed. And that's why you see this content online that you shouldn't be seeing. And this is the whole map of how to teach an algorithm for a six-year-old. So A was for algorithms. B is for Boolean logic. And those of you here in the room who were born in the 1960s and 70s, I'm fairly jealous for you, because you still had this tangible relationship with computers. You had transistor radios. You could take apart a computer and look inside of it. For my generation, we can jam-pack so much processing power into the computer, but they've become these gray rectangle boxes, unpenetrable, and we can put 300 million transistors at the pinpoint of a pen. But we don't know anymore how these machines that govern our lives work. And sometimes I wish I could make myself into the size of a silicone chip and go inside of a computer and learn how everything works from the inside out. Unfortunately, that's not possible with today's physics unless you're a children's book author. <laughs> So that's exactly what happens in the second Ruby book. It's an Alice in Wonderland story of a Ruby who goes into dad's office and she types in her password, but the computer doesn't work. And all of a sudden, the white mouse next to Ruby, it wakes up and says, Ruby, I've lost touch with the cursor. Can you help me find the cursor? And Ruby says, oh, of course. I'm the best computer debugger I know of. And they make themselves very, very small. And they fall deep, deep, deep inside of the computer to the layer of electricity, where there's billions of tiny switches that only know how to go on and off, on and off. They either pass electricity or they don't pass electricity. And you could find the cursor in here, but Ruby says it takes forever. You need eight of these bits to communicate one letter. Let's climb higher. And they meet the logic gates that take these tiny bits and do a little bit more complicated mathematical operations, operations with them, but still at the level of first grade math. And Ruby says, up, up, we must go until they meet the hardware layer of the computer, where there's the bossy CPU, the central processing unit of the computer that is really good at giving instructions to everyone else, like fetch, execute, store, but really forgetful. So it needs help from the RAM and the ROM and the hard drive to remember things. And they go dancing around the operating system. And eventually, they do also find the missing cursor. I'm not going to tell you how you'll need to buy the book for that. But most importantly, the kids get this really, really real sense of computers as abstraction machines. They follow how electricity turns into logic, how logic turns into hardware, how hardware turns into software, and how software turns into the games, apps, and programs are, that are changing our world. And I think it's really, really important to start to reinvent the narratives we have around telling what a computer actually is. Because this is the last generation of children that will use the metaphor of a computer having a screen, a keyboard, and a mouse. The next generation of comp uh, children are already now having voice interactions with their series and Alexas and Google M's. And we need to really rapidly start to think about how do we explain a computer for the next generation of children. So I'm still kind of working around how to figure out this problem. But I've asked often kids to draw what they imagine is inside of a computer. And I get this multitude of different ideas from thinking the computer is a content container of files and apps, uh, to talking about computers as abstract interlinked networks of components. These are the future computer architects you should be hiring. <laughs> 
the scanographers who come up with narratives and metaphors around what happens inside of a computer, the gear gurus, the kids who have this steampunk idea of how machines work, um, the kids who draw electricity and transfer, uh, wires and, and transistors. And all of these ideas, even though not one of them is 100% correct, all of them grasp the idea that while computers are magical, they are not made of magic. While computers are magical, they are not made of magic. They are made of logic. And that's a huge thing to learn when you're six years old and you're surrounded by computers that people tell are magic all day long. And this future is already here. Our children are going to go up, grow up in a world where our toothbrushes and our teddy bears are computers. And five years ago, when I started to do this activity where I show children a car, a grocery store, a dog, and a toilet, the kids could unanimously say that, Linda, none of those things are computers. But nowadays, when I talk with children, they already know the truth. They say that cars have navigation systems, they are computers. They talk about self-driving cars that are more and more common. In grocery stores, we have so many different kinds of computers, um, starting from the sensors that recognize when we come into the room, uh, to the teller's machine, to the security cameras, and the way we order food uh, into our homes, those are governed by software systems. Dogs are not computers, but a lot of kids have robot dogs, and they talk in length about how, in some countries, dogs put microchips under their skin, so if a dog runs away, you can find it more easier. And this is kind of my personal mic drop moment. In Scandinavian countries and Central European countries, toilets are not computers, but I tell the children that you go to Japan, <laughs> and in Japan, toilets are computers. You can modify the heat and the water pressure and the music, and there's even hackers who hack the toilets. <laughs> and nothing else gets discussed for the rest of the day with the children. That's absolutely a given. So we figure out that there's actually hundreds of computers in every single home already. And this is one of the most efficient, most low-key activities of the all time I've done, where I give children a tiny sticker with an on-off button on it. And I tell them that for this afternoon, you have this magical ability to make anything in this room into a computer by placing this sticker on it. And I collect these everyday items for them, and I ask them to imagine what is a future where your spoon is a computer or where an apple is a computer. And one time I had a little girl who chose the bicycle lamp in the middle. And she told me that if the bicycle lamp was a computer, she could go on a biking trip with her father. She could sleep in a tent. And in the evening, the bicycle lamp, it could also be a movie projector. And I think that's the moment we are all looking for. Not the moment when the kid understands the differences between Ruby and Haskell or the hashes and arrays of a programming language, but the moment when they realize three fundamental truths. First of them is that the world is not ready yet. There's so much we haven't invented or discovered. The second is technology is a wonderful way to make the world a little bit more ready because it has been always the way humankind has advanced. And the third and most important thing she got there was the idea that she herself could be a part of this change. For a moment there, she had the self-efficacy and self-belief to believe that she could be the world's first computer um, inventor of the bicycle lamp movie projector. And that's something I want us all to safeguard in ourselves. So how do we then explain what a computer is? It's curious that in order to explain the future of computing, we need to go almost 70 years back in time to the year 1945, when von Neumann was coming up with his von Neumann architecture for a computer. And with the children, I simplify it a little bit, and I tell them that a computer is any device where you input data, and you process that data somehow, and out comes the modified data. 
And the process is written instructions for the computer. So if you go sit in a car, for instance, there's a computer that recognizes you're sitting in the car and that you've forgotten to buckle your seatbelt. And out comes that beep, beep, beep noise we think about and hate so much. And then the children say, this seems academic. So we actually build an input-output machine. And the children become the input data that crawls inside of the computer. There's tiny pieces of instruction like come out, crawling, uh, backside first. And then they go round and round and round this computer and get a very physical sense of what it means uh, that input process output is one of the most fundamental ideas of computing. And this all matters, because computers, the way we know it right now, they are changing. And I think one of the important things, if lear not learn to code, then what? Uh, I think is to give the concept of a notional machine to the children, which a little bit simplified is an abstraction of the computer that one can use for thinking about what a computer can and will do. A mental, robust mental model of what a human can do well and what a machine can do well. And that brings us to the last letter of the day, which is C, and it stands for creativity and computers. And it starts with AI and machine learning. So every time I read a newspaper article nowadays, uh, or newspaper, there's usually at least one fear-mongering article about how AI is taking over the world, how it's doing all these different tasks, how jobs are being um, like taken away, and so forth and so forth, to the point where there was a little boy who came to me and said, Linda, what am I going to do when I grow up, when robots do all the jobs? And I tell him, don't you worry about that, love. We'll figure it out, but you need to have a pragmatic and optimistic idea about the future. And the adults who write these stories, they remind me of the medieval map makers who would make maps and every time there was an unknown, they would just write out, here be the dragons. And that's intellectually lazy, and that's fearful, and that's going to cost us our future. Because what AI actually is, and machine learning, it's data. And data, like we saw earlier, it's the click, click, clicks you do online, it's the behaviors, it's the sensory data. And all of that da data gets wrapped into different kinds of services. So it's not Skynet, it's not Terminator. And I try to be very, very clear when I talk with children that even though we say that a machine can see, it can communicate, it can move, it can reason, and maybe it can even be creative, we're using these human-centric verbs um, as a short handle for the actual technologies behind them. So even though we say that a computer can now communicate with us, a computer is no closer to the intelligence level of a six-year-old than it was in 1970. Rather, very specific areas of computers have become better because of some amazing technologies. So if in the past we wanted to ask if this thing over here is a cat, we would have needed to write those long instructions on what a cat looks like, like a cat is an animal with two ears and it comes in these five colors. And instructions like these would be fairly brittle, they would break down easily and computers would be really bad at recognizing cats. What we do nowadays is we ask the computer if this thing here is a cat and we collect the computer examples of things that are cats. And we allow the computer to build a model, so look at those different examples and look for patterns that we humans can't necessarily see. And then give an answer to the question. But very importantly, I tell the kids, it's not actually an answer, it's a probability that we're getting from the computer. So when you look at the whole machine learning model, uh, what, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what we're actually seeing is that there's a lot of places where we humans are much needed. First of all, we need human curiosity to ask the questions to solve and set the problems. We need humans to often gather the first training data for the machine. And we need humans to answer, uh, to assess the answer and see if it's something that can actually be deployed or, or used in society. 
And even though we talk about building a model as this black box of full of mystery, we really don't know how a human brain recognizes a hairbrush from a pineapple. And I think that's going to be one of the most exciting things for the computer science industry to start to explain how computers make these decisions and come up with different narratives and metaphors to explain how, for example, neural networks work or how deep learning actually functions. And we can't wait for someone else to be doing this job for us. It's our responsibility. We can't say that this is a black box you can't look inside. And the final bit I talk to children about is the data gathering. So again, six-year-olds, no bigger than that. And I show them these pictures, and I show them we are trying to teach the computer to recognize a cat. What is the bias the computer might learn from only looking at these examples of cats? And the kids say, oh, all cats are gray. Oh, all cats have blue or green eyes. And I say, bingo. Now draw a cat that is brown and maybe has yellow eyes. And then we look at these four teacups, and we try to figure out what is the inbuilt bias the computer is learning about the concept of a teacup. Maybe it wouldn't recognize grandma's teacups that have flowers on them. It wouldn't recognize Japanese teacups that don't have handles. And it probably wouldn't even recognize a teacup with a handle on the left-hand side. And these seem like innocent remarks. But as we are automating more and more of our society with um, artificial intelligence systems, we can't accidentally create face recognition systems that don't recognize that not all nurses are women, that recognize only certain skin color or certain shapes of eyes. And we practice this with the children by posing very silly machine learning problems and collecting training data and looking at very simple problems like, I want to teach the computer to recognize the letter N. How many different kinds of letters N there is in the world? And this is a child who wanted to teach the computer to recognize what a happy person looks like and cut out thing, uh, pictures from happy people from Finnish magazines. And we can immediately see what a homogenic country Finland is and how problematic systems like these would be. And since this is a programming audience, the last example I want to show is of a girl who wanted to teach her artificial intelligence system to recognize a unicorn. And she painstakingly drew the pictures of the unicorns, and then finally she says, I'm going to draw the unicorn from behind. <laughs> and it took her forever, but she got there and her system is now complete. <laughs> In essence, what they are learning is that even though AI might look magical. It's not magic. It's the same input process output thing that is happening everywhere in computing. And I hope that by doing exercises like this, they again will be more fearless, more optimistic, and have an idea about how to build the future. I'm going to jump a little bit. We live in a world when we need vocabulary to describe what is happening around us. I read this article from The Guardian where there were uh, computer, um, like researchers who were showing children two sets of pictures. One set of the pictures had pictures of Pokemon species, and one set of the pictures had pictures from the natural world, like trees and plants. And by far, the children had much more vocabulary to describe the Pikachu than the birch tree. They recognized the Bulbasaur better than the badger. And the researchers were really worried because, again, what happens to democracy in our world where we don't have vocabulary to describe the nature around us? But also, I think in the world of technology, we have so many of these words that become these black boxes, these suitcase words that we throw from one person to another, like algorithm, neural network, artificial intelligence, that we never open and unbox. And coming up with new narratives and metaphors is the ultimate way to start to explain and make these concepts approachable. Take something like the internet. A little boy once came to me and asked, Linda, is the internet a place? And I tell him, no, no, no. Internet is this global interconnected network of computers. You can think of it like the global uh, village or the information superhighway. You can go surfing online. And I felt really good about myself. And then I realized this child 
has never pressed the disconnect button on the internet. The internet is not the same as it was in the 1990s when I was growing up. And the metaphors, they need to be updated. So when we talk about the internet, should we talk about the fiber optic cables that go from the bottom of the sea all the way to the space? And the server farms that store more and more of the data about ourselves, our families and our societies? Or should we maybe talk about the data? How the data travels around the world eight times in a second? Or should we talk about Gagnum style, about cat videos, about the explosion of creativity that happens when the four billion of us can be in contact with one another? And I think this is the challenge of teaching technology. You not only teach the hardware, you not only teach the software, and you not only teach the societal impact of what's happening around you. You need to be teaching all of these things at the same time. And this is where the big luminaries of computer science come in. I think we need to talk more about the people who build and shape these systems. We need to get the children a sense of the future and help them imagine what the technology of the future might look like. And I'm really worried because I see a generation whose Vietnam War moment, whose 9-11 moment is Greta Thunberg and the climate change. And the children have a reason to be angry, as they should be. But I worry that that's not a place where the future of technology is going to come from. Because when we think about the history of technology, the optimistic Northern Californian hippie movement, man to the moon, civil rights movement, was the cultural backdrop for the PC and the Macintosh. And a dystopian world where technology is a threat is not the place where we start to develop solutions for the future. And that's why we need to dream bigger. We need to teach our children to imagine plausible futures with technology. And when you think about it, there's very few people who are doing it right now. Everything in Black Mirror is a dystopia. Everything that has to do with technology is somehow threatening and scary. So all of the storytellers, filmmakers, poets um, in the room start to think about how you can tell more optimistic, yet pragmatic stories about the future. I think computer science needs utopian fiction. And we need more stories about the humans who build these things, stories about the things, stories about the big ideas, and stories about the human imagination. Not only about the latest iOS update or the hardware upgrades we see. Finally, this is a slide where I usually end. I tell about how technology is um, in Greek, the techniques and tools and competencies to solve problems and how we need human uh, abilities to go along with the tools and how the Greek had a very kind of broad idea of agriculture and democracy as technology. I talk about how computers used to be humans who were really good, actually not humans, women who were really good at calculating long series of numbers and the ballistic missile uh, trajectories and how maybe in the future computers will again be human. Or we human will again be computers. But in recent years, I found this very fascinating quote from Jose Ortega y Gasset, who says that technology is the production of superfluities today as in the Paleolithic age. That is why animals are atechnical. They are content with the simple act of living. And the way I understand this quote, this definition of technology, is that technology is about having an imagination being able to tell stories, being able to think into the future. And that's what we need nowadays. We need more people who can think about how to use technology to build a future. And I'm going to end with a final definition of technology that comes from a nine-year-old little girl. And hopefully it's a little bit more utopian, optimistic idea about what technology for the next generation will look like. And it looks like this. Technology is electricity that loves 
I'm just going to repeat that again because it's my favorite definition of technology. So, technology is electricity that loves. It is used to play. I use it to have a conversation with my mom. We use a WhatsApp application. And then finally, and most importantly, people uses technology. Thank you very much. <laughs>